welcome and thank you for joining us today. Uh, today is um, the webinar is about understanding universal design for learning, universe, understanding universal design for learning. Um, we are joined here by Piper Slowinski. Piper has been working at PYD uh, since early 2012. She has a BA from Gettysburg College in a self-created major focusing on child development and disability uh, and a master's in nonprofit leadership from the Questrom School of Business at Boston University. Piper had a form of cancer while growing up in that experience, having a temporary disability instilled in them the desire to be an advocate and ally to the disability community. She has worked with people uh, with disabilities for the past 13 years. When she's not at work, Piper enjoys hiking and camping, video games, uh, DND, &D, and geeking out all uh, geeking out over things sci-fi and fantasy. And then we also have Kristen Humphrey. Uh, Kristen Humphrey is the National Disability Mentoring Coalition Director uh, and has worked at PYD since 2010. She co-authored the manuscript Expanding Horizons, a pilot mentoring program linking college graduate students and teens with ASD, uh, which has published in the Journal of the Clinical Pediatrics in 2015. Kristen has presented regionally, nationally, and globally on the topics of mentoring and inclusion. Kristen graduated magna cum laude from Connecticut College with a BA in psychology and was a selected scholar for the Holleran Center Pro Holleran Center's program in community action and public policy. She holds a master's in public administration from Clark University and a graduate certificate in human service management in Clark University. I'm also just going to drop the link to our uh, closed captioning in the chat so you can go ahead and check that. And while I do that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kristen and Piper. Great, thank you so much for the introduction and it's nice to see everyone here and thank you for joining us today. We are going to upload a slide deck in a moment. And so as mentioned today, the focus is universal design for learning, concepts and implementation. And you just met us, but here we are again. I'm Kristen, NDMC director, and I will leave my email here. So if you have any questions after, feel free to reach out. Um, happy to answer those. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And anything you want to add, Piper? I did a very thorough introduction, so thank you. Um, it's great to see you all, um, see some of you again. Um, yeah, Piper, she or they pronouns, National Inclusion Manager at PYD. Um, great, thanks. And then we will share the agenda. Uh, we'll have a brief background on Partners for Youth with Disabilities, talk about universal design, universal design for learning overview, UDL and hidden disabilities, and then talk about six concrete ways to incorporate UDL into your programming, case studies, real world application, and then wrap up with any questions that you have. The learning objectives are to increase your understanding of the scientific research behind universal design for learning, to develop proficiency in the key tenets and principles of UDL, to increase your understanding of how UDL concepts address the needs of youth with hidden disabilities, and to develop an understanding of how to utilize UDL concepts in your own programs. And then for background on Partners for Youth with Disabilities, you may have heard of us before, but uh, if not, just to share a reminder, our mission is to create a world where young people with disabilities can lead self-determined lives that are filled with dignity, pride, and purpose. We do this through a variety of direct service programs and training and technical assistance. 
for our direct service programs that build the skills and abilities of young people with disabilities, we have a one-to-one -one mentoring program, a group mentoring program that focuses on theater and uh, an online mentoring program, job readiness training and career readiness programs, leadership development programs, and then we guide organizations in becoming inclusive through our disability training and technical assistance on inclusion. So then to start with a, another quick activity or question, uh, what is universal design? And when you hear that term, universal design, we'd love for you to take a moment to share any words, phrases, or images that come to mind. And you can do this by typing it in the chat, or you can use your raise hand feature if you wanna share it verbally. And I can write that in the chat as well. So what words, phrases, or images come to mind? We are a small group, so you can also feel free to kind of popcorn style unmute and, and pop it in. Um, if, if it ends up being a problem, we can, yeah. But like, yeah, so unmute and pop in if you want. Accessibility for all, it's a great one. Diversity, great. Awesome. Anything else come to mind? Challenging bias. All right, well, if you think of others, feel free to add it to the chat or chime in. And as you're thinking of that, uh, we can go into the next slide. For background, universal design is the design and composition of an environment so that it can be accessed, understood, and used to the greatest extent possible by all people, regardless of their age, size, ability, or disability. It is an environment or any building, product, or service in that environment. Uh, should be designed to meet the needs of all people who wish to use it. Simply put, universal design is good design. So you hit upon it when you talked about accessibility. That is a huge part of universal design. And the seven principles of universal design were developed in 1997 by a working group of architects, product designers, engineers, and environmental design researchers. And it was led by the late Ronald Mace, who's a design pioneer, an internationally recognized architect. And he went to North Carolina State University. So part of the main concept of universal design is that when you build it right in the first place, it, as a good design, you don't need additional adaptation or specialized design for individuals if that original design is made fully accessible. So it's kind of about do it right the first time. And this is a benefit for the full community. And as an example, thinking about a ramp for wheelchairs is also useful for those with strollers, suitcases, shopping carts. So doing it right the first time. Next slide, please. 
So in this um, image or activity, we'd like you to think about examples of features and products in your day-to-day -day life that benefits the whole community. There are a couple of examples in this image here. Um, for example, the widened doors. Uh, you can see the lower light switch, the accessible cabinets. So different examples within this image that are specifically universal design to be benefiting the widest group of people. But if you could take a moment, we'd love to hear examples of universal design that you can think of in your lives that, that benefit the whole community. So feel free to, again, use the chat or share verbally. And I can write it out as well. I'll give a moment for you to think about that question and share any thoughts that come to mind. Stephanie shared the bus being able to be lowered to allow folks with different mobility needs to enter. Great. Awesome example. Yeah, just to go off of that, the bus being able to go lower for folks who use wheelchairs, that also you know, is beneficial for parents with strollers. Um, for folks with limited mobility, even if they aren't using a wheelchair, using a walker or other things, like it's, you know, again, like built for a specific um, accessibility issue, but ends up helping everyone to some extent or another, making the overall experience more accessible and inclusive, which is the whole idea of universal design. Um, so if you're thinking, if you're thinking buses and you're thinking transportation or commuting, they're actually a good, like, there are a good other handful of examples of UD kind of in a regular daily commute potentially that um, uh, uh, to kind of get y'all thinking like um, the lights at sidewalks, the like the walk or pause lights and those ones where they have the, not just the light, but the noise that's associated with it and kind of telling you when to walk, when not to walk. Um, those can be incredibly helpful for folks. Um, so not only, you know, that light is really helpful, not only for blind individuals, so they know when to walk and when not to walk, but frankly, is also really helpful for many of us that might just be distracted and looking at our phones half the time, as opposed to looking at exactly where we're going um, or looking at when, if the light changed or not for us to walk. You hear that noise and you're good to go. Um, yeah, again, like something built um, in the environment that helps make it more accessible for everyone. So any other ideas or examples that folks can think of? What about places um, or buildings that have like the automatic revolving doors? Yeah. It's a great example. Yeah, revolving doors, this little door opener buttons. Um, mm -hmm. Also, similarly, to be able to like make it easier. Frankly, so many doors are just so heavy these days mm -hmm. <laughs> that those door opener buttons or the revolving ones are just like so much easier for so many folks. Yeah, great. And then Monica shared, I get prepackaged medications for my grandmother with dementia, but it's helpful for forgetful individuals as well. Great. Thank you for sharing these. Any other examples that come to mind?
automatic doors at grocery stores. Can you imagine how challenging a grocery store would be if they didn't have those automatic door openers and everything? For everyone, again, everyone benefits from it. Um, yeah. Elevators. Um, and then Dory shared closed captioning is great for non native speakers. Yeah, that's great. Excellent example. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing uh, all of these different examples. And then this graphic from Microsoft is a, a great example of how fluid disability can be. So thinking about that disability could be something permanent, temporary, or situational. Uh, in the first example, a permanent might be having one arm. Temporary might be having an arm injury where you have a, a cast and that temporarily uh, changes your um, uh, arm mobility. And then situational could be a new parent where you're, you're carrying a baby and that changes your arm uh, accessibility and mobility. And this is helpful to think about in the context of universal design because it really doesn't necessarily matter if you have a disability in terms of being able to benefit from this design. So the whole idea is that these designs are helping everyone to, to create a greater number of access. And um, given how fluid disability is, that it's something you can dip in and dip out of, um, that is all the more benefit of creating a design in the first place. Great. Um, so then segueing into universal design for learning. Before we get into what it is, we do have a quick video with some background on UDL. Imagine you went into a big clothes store and all that was in sale was one type of outfit in one size with no talk given to different individual body shapes or personalities. That would be crazy, right? Expecting everyone to be able to fit into the same size and express themselves in the same colour and style? Yet in many cases, that's exactly what is happening in our education system. When it comes to learning, variability is the rule, not the exception and our college campuses are now grappling with the demands of an increasingly diverse cohort of learners, with increasing numbers of international students, students from different cultural and socioeconomic backgrounds, mature students, and students with disabilities. Despite this, curriculums are still designed for the mythical average learner, and all are expected to engage and learn on the same terms. Not enough flexibility is built in at the design stage, to give all students equal opportunities to learn in ways that play to their own strengths. So, how can our institutions respond to these challenges? Enter Universal Design for Learning, or UDL for short. UDL is an educational framework that guides the design of learning goals, materials, methods and assessments, as well as the policies surrounding these curricular elements with the diversity of learners in mind. The framework was developed by US organization CAST and is based on research in the field of neuroscience. It promotes three core principles for educators to build into their teaching practice, calling on them to provide students with multiple means of engagement, representation and action and expression. The framework includes a set of guidelines on how you can turn these principles into practice, for example, by fostering collaboration with the introduction of group work with clear goals, roles and responsibilities. By using different types of media to support learning and ensuring that all materials are accessible. 
and by providing a choice of assessment instruments while maintaining robust learning outcomes. You are probably already including some UDL elements in your practice without realising it, and there's much more to explore. So don't be afraid to let Universal Design for Learning give you a new lens through which to look at your teaching and learning practice and help you to better reach all of your students. For more information and resources, visit ahead.ie slash UDL. Awesome. And we'll send the slides after if you want the link to those resources. But that's a quick introduction to what is UDL. And um, it is, again, related to the principle of universal design. And it's a framework for teaching and learning. The goal is to minimize the need for individual um, accommodations or modifications by teaching and designing curriculum or programs in a way that reaches the widest range of students possible. So similar to the physical design concept, um, creating a wide range uh, of processing in that design. It also acknowledges and understands that there's no one size fits all for learning. And it provides flexible goals, methods, materials, and assessments. So again, it's key that it's designing for accessibility rather than accommodating after the fact um, as, as much as possible, capturing a wide range of learners because we all think and learn differently. And this benefits youth and uh, adults, whether or not you know if they have a disability, it just uh, acknowledges that that wide, vast range of how we process and learn. So why UDL? It recognizes the diversity of learners. I, I remember that word popping up in your initial brainstorming, and that's absolutely right. Everyone learns differently, not just students with disabilities. And it is a framework that can be used when designing curriculum, instructional practices, and program design. It's a proactive way of making learning inclusive. I think that proactive word is key versus reactive, rather than doing things after the fact, getting it right in that initial design. It's based on research on neuroscience, the learning sciences, and cognitive psychology. And Dr. David H. Rose at CAST was the first to define UDL. Then turn it over to Piper to get a bit into the brain. Yeah. Um, might get a little wonky now for a little bit, at least not, not too deep or anything, but just to give you a little bit more of an idea of kind of some of the underpinnings of UDL and to help kind of make this more concrete a little bit. Um, as Kristen said, like the philosophical roots of UDL really has its ties and connection with universal design as a concept. Universal design being built out like for the physical built world. And then UDL is kind of like, okay, how can we apply these same principles, but in a classroom setting specifically for education? Um, there's also been a lot of research on when doing that, when building in these UDL principles, like like the specific like neuroscience and how it act, um, how teaching in this way activates different parts of our brains, activates them in different ways, um, and um, and allows for deeper, more engaged learning from everyone. So, I you don't need to remember the exact details of like what part of the brain gets activated and what piece, but um, you know there are three, as was talked about in that video. There are kind of like three big pieces, three kind of core sections and areas of universal design for learning. These three principles. There's um, what is called like the recognition network, the strategic network, and the effective networks that are like the 
um, the parts of the brain that are kind of being activated in these different ways by the, the what of learning, by teaching um, through different modalities. So you're not always just lecturing out to the class. You're lecturing and then having small group work and you're building in some videos, you're having some collaborative activities, um, maybe a pair share, maybe a share out to the room, like you are teaching in through different modalities that what you're um, allowing people to like activating that recognition network more. The how of learning is providing people different ways of like, um, you know, uh, expressing themselves and expressing what they are learning in different ways. So, um, you know, the idea like as written here, like writing an essay or solving a math problem are strategic tasks, but like providing people with options on how they are engaging in that way. Um, so they're given choice or opportunity in many ways so that like people are what able to engage in the way that works well for them. Um, and then the why of learning is that motivates like the really like the core, some of the core sections of our brain really about like, how do we engage learners? Um, how are we allowing them to get invested in the topic and invested in what they're learning, um, to feel like they have some control over it and to feel motivated and excited by it. How do we activate those networks to get them engaged? For activating, for activating that why, for activating the how network, activating the, the what, um, we're gonna help make more engaged learners overall. As Kristen mentioned, there, um, the organization CAST is the organization that has kind of spearheaded most of the research around UDL, has spearheaded the like taking this, taking the universal design principles, taking the research done around it, taking around the neuroscience and distilling it down into some um, essentially best practices and guidelines that they publish and put out and update on a regular basis. Um, CAST is also a relatively local organization. They are based in, in the North Shore of Boston, I believe. Um, so, uh, you know, close by, they're a great organization to get connected with and stuff. Um, they have a lot of great resources on their website. I'd recommend checking them out. Um, CAST, uh, udlcenter.org, or might even be cast.org these days, I think. Um, but yeah, so their, their principles is, um, as was talked a little bit very briefly about the video, it's hinted at in the, the brain networks. It maps out to these three sections, the representation, action, expression, and engagement. And these are the, these same, you know, these colors, the, if you're following by the color, the purple, blue, and, and green in the same order, they're the ones that map to these same brain networks, the, the what of learning, the how of learning, the why of learning. <clears throat> that what of learning, that multiple means of representation, that's saying, okay, are we, you know, the way they break it down is kind of three, three sub principles and a um, whole bunch of like different um, uh, other little like, you can view this as like a checklist approach of which of these are you using and activating in your classroom. You can also use it as like with each of these on their site, you can dig in and click and read some examples of how you can incorporate these into your work. But um, basically providing options for providing, differentiating your learning and differentiating your teaching so that you are teaching in different ways and different modalities. Um, you're not all you know, the idea around language, mathematic expressions and symbols, you're not always expressing information in the same way, allowing people to engage in different ways. Um, providing options for perception. How are we, how are you displaying the information? Are you always talking about it? Do you have a visual alongside of it? Um, so, you know, like right now we're engaging, we're providing multiple means for perception. You can read the transcript, you can listen to us talk, you can see the slides right in front of you as well. Um, uh, yeah, make helping promote understanding through clarifying things that might be confusing and providing like, you know, providing way, essentially like learning wayfinding, helping 
ease comprehension, um, highlighting big pictures, big ideas, allowing for maybe visual processing, um, providing information in a different way that'll allow people to um, engage with it differently. The um, multiple means of action and expression is again that, um, that how of learning. Um, actually, how are we engaging? How are we learning? Providing, this is this big one for this is just providing multiple options for folks. You're not always doing things the same way. Um, you're varying things up in your classroom on a day-to-day -day basis and even within the same lesson, um, moving through different modalities of teaching. Providing options for movement, incredibly important for many youth to be able to move and engage. Um, for many young youth, many youth with ADHD, youth with autism, movement is incredibly important for them for managing their emotion, emotions and emotional regulation, but also for helping them learn and engage. Some students learn best through being able to move <clears throat> um, and maybe through tactiles, getting their hands directly on something. Uh, others, that the idea of providing options for expression and communication. There's different ways to communicate, different ways to express um, yourself. Some people express themselves best through speaking and sharing. Others, that's really uncomfortable. That's not the best way for communicating or um, if others, the best way is like writing an essay or um, writing something out or write, doing something creative, creating a poem or art piece that represents what you've learned or taken away. Um, providing opportunities, yeah, multiple ways for folks to show what they have learned and to engage in that learning. And then last one is op options for executive function. So yeah, our um, helping support, yeah, goal setting in the classroom, um, <clears throat> helping students plan and create, create strategies on how they're going to execute certain tasks. If a, if a project is multiple steps long, helping students through that and thinking that through. Um, and also like breaking some things down. And so it's really clear and easy of, um, you know, that executive functioning to help students. Some students can't always take like the full big picture and see all the individual steps that need to go into it. So helping break that down. Um, <clears throat> And support them with as they you know have hurdles and issues along the way. And the last one, multiple means for engagement, is all about um, like yeah, they say recruiting interest and sustaining interest. It's about how can you get people interested and engaged, and then how do you keep them that way? <laughs> so, are you providing options on the specific topic? Options and choice is another big one. This is a common theme with UDL. Options and choice allows youth to feel more control of what they learn. Allows all of us, even as adult learners, to feel more control and engagement with what we're learning, more investment in it, um, more connection with it. <clears throat> um, make the goals and objectives like really meaningful and help that feel connecting to folks. Um, yeah, and opportunities for collaboration and community to be working together as like not just individually, but also being kind of engaging as a group. So anyway, um, I could go really deep into any and all of these, but wanted to give you at least an idea of kind of like the three big sections, what kind of goes into each of them, um, how they relate and connect, and like, and some of the common themes that we can kind of see across these. So, um, let's do this real quick. So next up, we do have another, we have another little video um, that this is a video put out by CAST themselves about UDL. It's about five minutes long or so. So what I'd love to do is watch this video and then for folks afterwards to share out like one nugget or takeaway that you have and um, one nugget or takeaway that specifically uh, that jumped out to you as something that could be relevant for your day-to-day -day work or for, for something that could be relevant for your work or that you could see applying um, in some form in, in the work that you're doing, the teaching that you're doing. Um, all right. Sound good to folks? Okay.
Oh, Stephanie's jumping in already, creating options for engagement. Fantastic. All right. Well, let's watch the video and then we'll dive in deeper with our nuggets and ideas of what you can be applying to your own work right now based on this. All right. Here we go. Oh, come on. This teacher needs to meet a curriculum goal, and she's got a very diverse group of students. And so does this teacher. And this one. Most do. In fact, research shows that the way people learn is as unique as their fingerprints. What does this mean for teachers of today? Classrooms are highly diverse, and curriculum needs to be designed from the start to meet this diversity. Universal Design for Learning is an approach to curriculum that minimizes barriers and maximizes learning for all students. Whoa, that's a fancy term. Universal Design for Learning. Let's unpack it a bit. Let's think about the word universal. By universal, we mean curriculum that can be used and understood by everyone. Each learner in a classroom brings her own background, strengths, needs, and interests. Curriculum should provide genuine learning opportunities for each and every student. Now let's think about the word learning. Learning is not one thing. Neuroscience tells us that our brains have three broad networks. One for recognition, the what of learning. One for skills and strategies, the how of learning. And one for caring and prioritizing, the why of learning. Students need to gain knowledge, skills, and enthusiasm for learning, and a curriculum needs to help them do all three. But every learner is unique, and one size does not fit all. So how do we make a curriculum that challenges and engages diverse learners? This is where the word design comes in. A universally designed building is planned to be flexible and to accommodate all kinds of users, with and without disabilities. It turns out that if you design for those in the margins, your building works better for everyone. Curb cuts and ramps are used by people in wheelchairs, people with strollers, and people on bikes. Captioning on TV serves people who are deaf, people learning English, people in gyms, and spouses who get to sleep at different times. UDL takes this idea and applies it to the design of flexible curriculum. UDL goes beyond access because we need to build in support and challenge. So how do we use the UDL framework to make learning goals, methods, materials, and assessments that work for everyone? First, ask yourself, what is my goal? What do I want my students to know, do, and care about? Then ask, what barriers in the classroom might interfere with my diverse students reaching these goals? To eliminate the barriers, Use the three UDL principles to create flexible paths to learning so that each student can progress. Number one, provide multiple means of representation. Present content and information in multiple media and provide varied supports. Use graphics and animation, highlight the critical features, activate background knowledge, and support vocabulary so that students can acquire the knowledge being taught. Number two, provide multiple means of action and expression. Give students plenty of options for expressing what they know and provide models, feedback, and supports for their different levels of proficiency. Number three, provide multiple means of engagement. What fires up one student won't fire up another. Give students choices to fuel their interests and autonomy. Help them risk mistakes and learn from them. If they love learning, they will persist through challenges. And remember, always keep in mind the learning goal get rid of barriers caused by the curriculum, and keep the challenge where it belongs. And that's it. Okay, quick recap. Show the information in different ways. Allow your students to approach learning tasks and demonstrate what they know in different ways. And offer options that engage students and keep their interest. Universal design for learning equals learning opportunities for all. For more information on UDL, go to www.cast.org.
All right. So a um, little bit of a different way of hearing what we've been talking about too. A little bit of a recap of, of stuff. So what were folks nuggets or your takeaway? What's like, what is something that is jumping out to you so far right now as a principle or practice that would be helpful or useful for you and your work? I know Stephanie said before the video, creating options for engagement. Um, Stephanie, what would, what could that look like? Oh, okay. Asking folks which way they learn best and try to incorporate those lessons throughout those ways throughout your lesson. Um, May, I really liked the line about when you design for those in the margin, you build something that then works for everyone. Mm hmm. It's a really great design principle in general, um, instead of, um, and this works regardless if you're talking about curriculum, you're talking about spaces, you're talking about just events, you're planning. If you think about from the very beginning, how can I design this to work for wheelchair users, for, for work with students with autism, with ADHD, with learning disabilities, if you incorporate some of the people who are normally most excluded from events in your design thinking from the very beginning, you're gonna come up with a final solution that's just so much more inclusive of everyone that comes into that space. Again, that idea of universal design, if you build it build um, in a way that as folks walk into the space, it's flexible and adaptable, different people can engage in different ways, um, it's gonna include everyone a little bit better because none of us is 100% normal. And you know, what I mean is like normal when we're talking about like design and, and engagement. Um, Evelyn and Sharon totally agree with me, proactive versus reactive. This is a big, like one of the big lessons I feel like of universal design, of UDL, is that just like the biggest shift in approach is being proactive around design and accessibility from the very beginning of when you're starting to think and plan your curriculum. Um, our default approach to like to accessibility through like the ADA and law and stuff is one of, after the fact, reactive. It's saying, okay, there is a barrier or issue. And so legally we need to make an accommodation to like get around that barrier and still provide equal access. But this is like taking things a step further than like that legal compliance because you're not being reactive once there is an issue, you're trying to be as proactive as possible from the very beginning. Like how can we build that space? Um, initially so that whoever comes in, they will be able to engage in the way that works best for them. So, um, which is, you know, it is that step. Um, um, in general, that's why we in organization don't really focus a ton on the ADA or because it is great and it's a necessary law, but to create a really inclusive environment, you gotta go a little bit beyond that, you know, be proactive instead. Other nuggets? folks had the takeaways in the video, ideas of things you could incorporate, um, lesson or a lesson, a, um, an idea if you had from watching this is something you could do or incorporate into your work. Evelyn, in one of our computer trainings, first we taught tips on interviewing. Today, they took turns interviewing each other, and tomorrow they'll participate in mock interviews. Love that. Yes, different ways of um, different means of action and expression, I think, right there, you know, right? And different means of learning, different modalities of engagement um, being involved in that, and that you're engaging them in a couple of different ways and allowing them then to express what they're learning in a couple of different um, ways as well. Yeah. Wonderful example. All right, cool. 
cool. Okay, so um, so and this has been hinted at a little bit in some of the um, so what we've been talking about so far, but a large part of the reason that it's so important to talk about UDL, to think about UDL design in this way, is that frankly, um, not all disabilities are visible disabilities. Um, you, I'm sorry, my dog is being a pest right now. I don't know if you heard that, but um, so um, yeah, not all disabilities are visible disabilities. In fact, majority of them, upwards of 80% of them are hidden disabilities. Um, disabilities that are not immediately apparent upon meeting somebody. And, you know, this is incredibly important because you, it comes to the fact that you can't necessarily walk into a classroom, you know, come into a Zoom room and know, oh, all these students, I can know just from looking at them of what their access needs are. I can know, I'll um, know how to best teach them in the classroom. Um, so that's like, one of the um, one of the reasons why it's important for UDL. So in general, um, wanted to we won't do this as a pair share because we're a small group and stuff. But just another question for the group of just like so we're thinking about youth with hidden disabilities. That like eighty percent of youth with disabilities who have a hidden disability of some form or another. Um, some examples being like autism, uh, ADHD, dyslexia, dyscalculia, um, depression, anxiety, other mental health conditions. Um, the list goes on. So many of the disabilities are, are hidden. Why, from all that we've been talking about UDL so far, what are some of the reasons and why do we think UDL is specifically and especially helpful when working with youth with hidden disabilities? Any ideas, any thoughts? Stephanie, to prevent disengagement. Mm-hmm, 100%. So from students that have been giving up. Yes, it's so important. Mm -hmm. Some students may feel ashamed or not even be aware of some hidden disabilities, 100%, you know? Um, in many disabilities, it can be a challenge getting that diagnosis, um, especially for, for young kids from marginalized backgrounds. So it can be difficult to have that official diagnosis and to be able to like then know what accommodations or supports you need um, because of like extra supports that label can unlock. So yeah, some students may feel ashamed. They may disengage, they may give up um, and they may not even be aware that they have a disability per se and and or if they do have they felt comfortable to share that in the classroom setting they the first time they met you you know um evelyn to encourage inclusion and active participation mm -hmm. yeah this is this is a way if you incorporate udl into your curriculum allows you to build a space from the beginning that regardless of if students are sharing with you their specific accessibility, their specific like disability information and accommodation needs and stuff, regardless if they're sharing it or not, you're building a curriculum, you're building a classroom that's going to help them be included and help them stay engaged and learn. Um, because otherwise, like it can be, it can be tough when you're first meeting a class to like, you know, some folks won't be 100% comfortable. Some folks may not know all of their access needs. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and it's it's a starting point too, if some students do need some, um, some big accommodations, it's a way to help level the playing field from the very beginning for everyone. So um, folks don't feel, students don't feel segmented or isolated or like differentiated from their peers. Everyone is being treated different. Everyone is being treated the same, but st and still able to engage. So, all right. So in our last half hour, we're going to try to get a little nitty gritty for y'all. We've been talking kind of big theory and stuff. So I'll pass it. Um, so we're going to go into like six specific ways that um, you can apply 
principles of UDL into a classroom environment, six areas to be thinking of, and some tips and tools that you could possibly use. Um, Great. Thank you. So the six areas that we will be talking about include space, program structure, goals, materials, assessment, and instructional methods. And we will start by space. So curious to hear your thoughts when you see these three different images on the screen. Do you have any thoughts in terms of what stands out as um, being a good design, universal design, or, or what is not um, a great design, what barriers you see? Any kind of initial reflections on these photos? And feel free to add in the chat or verbally. So Stephanie shared wheelchair accessibility and inaccessibility stands out immediately. Great, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. We were um, looking at this first picture on the left and uh, there's a ramp and that, that stands out as good in terms of the accessibility. However, if you look closely at it, once you get up the ramp, there is a, a small step by the door. So although the ramp is there, there's still an added barrier. Any other thoughts on what stands out as being a good design in this or? what barriers stand out. Um, Monica shares, I feel mixed about the second picture, seems very isolating and small, but may be helpful for a child with sensory issues. That's a really, really great point. Um, I appreciate that, yeah, so the, the quieter space could be positive for someone with sensory issues. Um, but then also the isolation could be a challenge. And even the kind of the cluttered tightness of it, if, if someone were using a wheelchair, getting in and out of that space might be challenging. And then Stephanie shared, I like how all of the chairs are facing each other in the third picture, maybe good for inclusion and community building. Yeah, that's a great point. So I like that you brought up kind of the purpose of the space and that structure could be great for collaboration that they're facing each other. Um, but if it were a lecture, maybe not the best space if they're not all kind of turning to the presenter. So thinking about the purpose of the space um, is really important. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, and yeah, that is a good point, Stephanie. But the pandemic has made me a permanent germaphobe. Yeah, that's an interesting consideration, too, in thinking about space. So great point. All right, well, thank you for sharing these. Uh, the next principle for consideration is program structure. And I know we've touched upon this, but thinking about using a variety of instructional materials and methods, such as project-based learning or cooperative learning, and then varied activities and learning environments. So multiple ways to engage and demonstrate that knowledge. 
clear visual aids and an example of that could be a schedule it could be having a timer in between activities clear expectations and someone may be hearing the expectations verbally and just not processing but having it in writing having that visual for some that is really what is going to make the difference in understanding that having clear procedures and transitions we know that structure can help reduce anxiety and then accessible materials so thinking about paper web and other formats and then multimedia technology access is another way to uh, create program structure next slide then in terms of the goals um, this relates back to the the brain concepts that Piper was covering before, but focusing on the what of the goal, rather than the how to allow for flexibility in how content is presented. And as an example, a student will increase job readiness skills through projects and activities. So that could mean writing a resume or doing a mock interview or working in an internship. So it's really the how can be different and that can be flexible, but it relates to that same what or the same goal. And this ties back to the example that was shared earlier with the, the mock interviews this is a great example. Another example of this flexible goal could be the student will learn about the history of photography and demonstrate understanding through various uh, photographic styles and skills. So allowing that flexibility in how the goal is performed. Next slide, please. In terms of materials, providing multiple ways for students to access the content being presented and providing choice often increases engagement as an added benefit. So when we were talking about why UDL is important, uh, I know that you folks brought up to prevent disengagement, to prevent giving up. And that's exactly right. Having the different materials is one other way to increase that engagement. And next slide, please. To offer examples of materials, PowerPoints help visual learners or those with attention issues. So if we were just saying all of this information verbally today without any visual slides, that, that might be hard uh, or harder for some to process. Digital text, so it can be converted to speech for those who struggle to read and words can be made larger. Um, another example might be someone could choose to listen to a book on Audible if that is how they process better than reading the book. Thinking about relevant websites, podcasts, videos. Um, so again, incorporating different forms of media and technology. And these can all be used along with more traditional methods like print text or group discussion. But adding in these other methods and options makes the material accessible to a wider range of learners. So giving this broad um, way of presenting information uh, to, to capture that diversity in learning styles and, and neurodiversity. Next slide, please. So an, another tip is in assessment, it should reflect the original learning goal, have varied options for how the individuals are assessed, having a well-defined rubric and guideline for what competencies you're looking for, the means by which the student reaches these can vary. 
and then sharing it with the student so they know what is expected. An example of this could be creating a portfolio, doing a demo, a video or a podcast or a poster project. So giving multiple ways that students can represent what they're learning and engage and reflect what they know. Next slide, please. In terms of instructional methods, when analyzing your teaching methods or whatever role you play in working with students, think about uh, the following areas, which are, again, multiple means of representation. So am I using multiple ways to present the material? Am I presenting content, uh, content via text, video, audio, sensory? And um, back to what Piper shared in the beginning, thinking about how that is engaging that part of the brain to use multiple means of representation. Multiple means of action and expression. So when you're designing curriculum or a program, asking yourself, am I giving my students multiple ways to demonstrate what they're learning? Which could be writing, presenting, drawing. Piper mentioned earlier, poetry might be how someone um, wants to express what they're learning. Um, for someone, verbally sharing is how they're going to do that best, whereas others typing in the chat is how they do that best. And then the last category, multiple means of engagement. So are you giving them multiple ways to engage with the material? And this relates to the interest boosting and the why um, that's why of when how they're learning and getting them really connected and engaged with the materials. So for again some different examples of what this could look like. Multiple means of representation can be providing multiple examples, so bringing in a guest speaker, a role play, using case studies, graphic organizing, going on a field trip, and using a variety of materials, whether that's visual, auditory, sensory, et cetera, movement, uh, and then scaffolding student learning, providing outlines, summaries, guides, and other tools. For examples of multiple means of action and expression, that can be modeling skills through role play and project-based learning, cooperative learning, and multimedia. And then multiple means of engagement can look like choice of a topic for a research paper, the option to work in pairs or small groups, the opportunity to publish or present a final product or project. So as you can see, there are a lot of different ways to incorporate these principles into what you're already doing. Next slide, please. So um, going into cooperative learning, it is a great method for developing social skills, engaging students, and making a more inclusive learning environment. That can look like or include a variety of roles for students. So someone might in a group be a scribe, a presenter, a timekeeper. It works for students who learn through discussion. And it's an opportunity for students to learn from each other in this process. Next slide, please. Um, so then I'll turn it over to uh, Piper for kind of getting into the final sections. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm going to pause on this question because I think we already talked about this a little bit, 
earlier. Um, when a, I think we can come back to it at the very end for any final little reflections. But to what Kristen was just talking about, about cooperative learning and about like classroom environments and stuff, I want to share this little tool and resource. I'm going to I'm going to have to change the share real quick because this is going to pop open in a browser tab. So hold with me real quick while I do this. Um, okay, yeah. So this is um, this is a resource that's out there to help kind of envision ways that in a classroom environment you can incorporate different like universal design for learning principles, cooperative learning principles and stuff directly in. Um, if you hover over, if you like, you know, select the, you know, we're in the high school classroom. If you hover over any of these like different classroom elements, it'll show you some like, specific things and how they help support learning in this classroom. Example here being little equity sticks talking about like cooperative learning and different roles for students as we have a little stick with different roles of um, that can help us sign out what student is going to be helping with what tasks throughout it. So they're all engaged in the classroom and feel like in, um, invested because they are like being asked to contribute in different ways. Um, interactive whiteboard up front if folks can touch and move things and engage directly with it. Oh, I can't actually read what that one is right there. Oh, it's a timer, timer display up there. So countdown to when transitions are gonna happen to, to the next activity or to the next thing. Um, having some prompts up on the side that have, um, uh, yeah, written prompts up there that students can always refer to throughout. Classroom bookshelf, uh, having a range of materials for different learners. So um, this is a link. We will definitely be providing these slides. You can kind of poke around it some more. Don't want to maybe quite do everything on here, but um, yeah, some digital resources available, some print resources, DVD resources, digital text for students that need it. So having you know students that need it, be able to have those little devices to allow to access things more um, on their desk. Um, yeah, so allows you to kind of play around and check out some like how this can all look and play out in a classroom environment. So um, I'll drop this link in the chat too if folks want to take a look at it and poke around themselves if there's anything you want to read more about. But it's an additional little resource to help kind of like, again, if that like visual piece is really helpful for you to like a little bit almost like hands on of how this could play out in a classroom. Um, it's a great little resource for kind of visualizing many of these things. So, um, okay. So um, we have about 10 minutes left together and was um, hoping to dig into a few or to spend what time we have left um, doing two things, answering a couple like case studies, thinking through how we could apply these principles in a certain different situations. And then, you know, we've already been reflecting about like how like things you can be incorporating into your classroom, but um, maybe we'll finish with, I think maybe we'll finish with another final reflection on that as well. So um, case study for everyone right now, I'm going to I'm going to read out this case study, and I'd love for folks thoughts about basically how we could take and use the principles of universal design for learning in this kind of context. What are some things we could do to um, make it a more engaging experience, to, to build, to make it a more inclusive experience? So you will be taking a group of students on a field trip to a ceramic studio in the local community. The goal of the trip is to both learn about ceramic arts, as well as to meet a local artist and hear about their career pathway. We're planning to have a pre-trip session to introduce students to ceramics, so they'll have some background going in, as well as to prepare them for the field trip experience. So, um, so that's our first scenario. What are folks' thoughts? What are things you could do either in that pre-trip session um, 
or on the trip itself in the uh, field trip and engagement to, yeah, incorporate some universal design for learning principles, which principles pop out to you of things you could possibly do or tweak. <clears throat> Oh, sorry, Monica. I, sorry, I do not have it up on a slide. Apologies. That's not great practicing what we preach here in terms of talking about multiple means of representation. I will type this in the chat um, so you can also see it here. But um, yes, in short, we'll be taking students on a ceramic um, field trip to talk with a local artist, hear about their career, and we're doing a pre-trip session. So what are some of the principles? How could we apply them to this scenario? To a field trip environment and or um, that pre-trip preparation. Ooh, Evelyn, day before the trip, hand out prompts what students expect to see in the trip. Fantastic, that extra preparation, extra ways of like digesting that information. Folks heard of social stories before. Social stories are really this is um, social stories are essentially taking out um, a trip to something. So a trip to a museum, um, a situation that's going to happen, and turning it into essentially a little storybook with step by step, with a picture and description of what's going to be happening at various steps along the way. There are these, you know, these sort of things exist for going to many like museums, um, but also like going to the airport. And you can make a social story for anything um, if a student will really benefit from it to be able to like see a future situation that they'll be going through themselves, be able to read it almost as like a fictional story or narrative. Um, helps for another way of processing the information. Uh, again, there's the visual uh, visual processing, um, reading out what's happening, um, multiple ways of engaging, and then like you're helping them prep ahead of time so that it's not like they're not being surprised, they're being prompted ahead of time, so they're not being surprised in the day of. Yeah, very good. Any other ideas folks have? <clears throat> How are we going to insert opportunities for like, uh, like to keep students invested this day? How are we gonna help them? Are we, how are we gonna add in different opportunities for engagement or choice as well? Or multiple modalities for learning, like so they can be like um, that, that idea of like movement and expression, like how are we incorporating that into the day? Dory, create a scavenger hunt of sorts. Uh, Fun idea. So like on the on the field trip itself, possibly. Um, maybe, yeah, if that that place you're going, if there's a couple of different things you want the students to be sure to learn or take away, um, but as opposed to just like hearing someone talk out of them up ahead of time ahead of time, if they can like get their hands on things, have a little scavenger hunt where they have to be looking for a certain um things um, expressing, maybe they're expressing what they found in a variety of ways. Either they can be like, take a picture of it or like create a little thing or um, like, how are they, how are they expressing what they found? Or like, what is your final takeaway from the trip to? Like, um, are they going to maybe write a little bit about what they, write a little bit about what they shared or draw something or create a little like ceramic to show what they've learned? Um, but yeah, I love the scavenger hunt idea of that really like tactile hands-on learning um, and really engaging in through that method. Excellent. All right, any final idea before we start to wrap up? Some th other thing I just threw out there is just that idea of choice and allowing students to like have choice, which will allow them to like feel more engaged and motivated in what they're learning. If like, how can you incorporate that into the day? Like, that's always a really important one. But like, can you provide like choice on even just something as simple as scheduling when they're going to do a certain thing? Um, maybe they can go see the ceramic studio first, or talk to the um, or talk to the artist first, and then groups can rotate and change. Maybe they're only choosing one or the other, um, depending. Um, 
I like what Evelyn's saying, next day of the trip, divide the class in groups to share takeaways through drawing, writing a song, etc. Ooh, love it. So they are, they are expressing themselves in a wide range of ways, but then also doing it like collaboratively in a small group as opposed to, um, yeah, fantastic. So yeah, all these, you know, with UDL, there is no one answer to anything. There's all sorts of different ways that you can go about incorporating these principles into a classroom um, and into what you're doing. It just involves a little bit of like that forethought intentionality, that, um, yeah, forethought and intentionality being the big ones, thinking of it ahead of time and, um, and being creative, being creative with it and um, not being stuck in that mindset of designing one way for the average learner. So. All right, and we are just about at time. So um, wanted to just say um, thank y'all for having us here today again. It was great talking and sharing. Um, if folks have any questions they want to ask that we haven't covered, they want to dig into a little bit more, now's a great time. This the you know we have the last few two or three minutes. If folks um, have any questions. Wonderful. Jaslyn just dropped into the chat, a uh, Google Doc for a survey um, feedback form. If folks who fill that out, it really helps us. We like to keep making sure our trainings are meeting folks' needs and um, engaging y'all. So please let us know how it was today. And yeah, thanks all for coming. If you do have questions, shout them out, drop them in the chat. But um, appreciate you all. Thank you.